Hey, this is Joseph Burnett. I'd like to explain to you a little bit about how we do Mac Runner um, auto scaling on AWS. Um, there's a little bit more to it than auto scaling Linux. There's a few more layers of abstraction. So I wanted to just kind of walk through it with uh, kind of a concrete visualization. Um, I can also put it in text and, and make a diagram, but I thought it'd be kind of helpful to see what the life of a job looks like um, on AWS M1 Max. So my audience here is engineers who kind of want to see what the big pieces are, someone who wants to understand how the architecture affects cost, or anyone else that's kind of interested in how to efficiently run GitLab jobs on AWS Max. So let's start off with um, GitLab Runner. So GitLab Runner is, is executing on uh, an instance somewhere. In this case, it's a GC um, instance. It's just a process running there. It could be anywhere. Um, it connects to gitlab.com, pulls down jobs, and um, gets execution environments and injects those jobs into them. Um, it's pretty much the standard way that GitLab runner works. We put it in alongside our other runners just because it's easiest to have it in the same infrastructure in the same cloud provider. Um, there's a difference though. This, this version of GitLab runner is using a new framework called Task Scaler. Now, Task Scaler is our primary auto scaler. It's uh, aware of machines and capacity. Um, it's aware of concurrency within those machines. Uh, it implements the algorithm, the standard GitLab runner algorithm, which responds to new jobs, creates um, instances on demand, and also has an idle configuration allowing you, allowing you to maintain extra capacity. This is the future of um, GitLab runner auto scaling. This is how we're going to replace Docker machine. Um, and as part of that, in order to uh, abstract away the cloud provider, we use a plugin system. So there's an out of process, there's a separate process which runs and provides um, access to some cloud provider through a common abstraction called the instance group. So when Task Scaler wants an, um, an instance in which to execute a job, it actually just asks the fleeting plugin, hey, um, give me another instance or um, give me the connection info for the instance of my choice. Uh, and it will create additional instances that way too in order to maintain the idle capacity. Um, so this is the fleeting plugin mechanism. And so of course the fleeting plugin takes the auto, the instance group um, um, calls and translates them into um, an auto scaling group in AWS, groups of machines, groups of instances that are the same are managed in an auto scaling group. And it stamps them out sort of one, two, three, all exactly the same. You ask for three, it gives you three, you turn it up to four, it creates another one all off of a launch template. Um, so this is this is great. Um, this is how Linux auto scaling works and how it will work. Um, but there's a little bit more to Max in AWS. One of the requirements of a Mac is that it needs to be on its own dedicated host. So these instances, rather than just getting thrown up there on common hardware, you actually have to put each one of these instances on a dedicated host. And those hosts need to be created as a separate resource. So there's something called a host resource group here, which manages um, creating and deleting hosts in response to instances created by the autoscaling group. So the task scaler here is our primary auto scaler, which scales the instances by job load and in order to maintain capacity. Um, the host resource group is another auto scaler whose only job is, is to scale in and out the dedicated hosts in response to demand for instances from the auto scaling group. So um, there's a few other caveats with running Max on AWS. Some of these come actually from the Apple's user agreement. Some of them come from just uh, limitations in the performance at a, this point in time. So it takes about, after you create an instance and it gets scheduled onto a dedicated host, it takes about 30 minutes for that instance to boot up and be ready. 
um, a second limit. So that's actually quite a bit of time. You don't really want to create an instance in response to a job that's waiting. You want to be able to schedule that job on a running instance within less than a minute, for sure. Um, another uh, slowdown is when that instance is removed, that dedicated host needs to spend 40 minutes scrubbing all of the data off of that before another instance can be rescheduled. So you lose that capacity for four minutes when an instance disappears. Um, the other limitation, which is based on the, on the end user agreement is, it, once you created a dedicated host, you actually need to keep it for a minimum of 24 hours. So even if you remove all the VMs, you have to keep them around for at least 24 hours. So that also kind of um, cuts into cost a little bit. So um, the last limitation to be aware of, and the one which leads to this next layer of uh, indirection, is there's um, your, Apple doesn't allow more than two VMs to be on a single um, host. So let me explain why this matters. If you put a job here in this instance and you run a job here, it is gonna it's gonna use the it's gonna have complete control of that execution environment. It's gonna put files everywhere. It's gonna do stuff. So when you do when you remove the job, you have to delete the the instance. Well, based because it's so slow, we don't want to actually delete the instances after every job. So we put each job inside of a nested VM. Okay, so these nested VMs are actually fairly fast to spin up. The image is already pre-baked into the AMI. You just spin up the VM as soon as the job is done, you delete the VM along with it. Now, Apple limits you to two. So um, we will put two jobs, up to two jobs on each of these instances, two nested VMs, um, but that's all. So there can be a couple different flavors um, based on different, you know, uh, OS, like about different um, um, tool tool chains, but they're all just baked in here and they come and go pretty quickly. So that's that's the level of isolation that we we provide is nested virtualization inside these Macs. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the. Um, I want to now that you can see what all the pieces are. I want to show you what the life of a job is. So let's say we get a couple of. Um, couple of jobs over here in GitLab that want to be executed on, on a Mac. One of these jobs arrives here. So let's pretend like this doesn't exist yet. You know, one of these jobs arrives here. Um, it's routed to this uh, um, execution, uh, to this executor, which is using task scaler. And task scaler says, OK, um, you want an execution environment. Great. It uses AWS fleeting plugin to find out what all of the instances are. It picks one of them, let's say, you know, this one here, and it assigns of the two VMs that you can run on each instance, it assigns slot zero and one. So when it when it comes back uh, to, to the runner, test scaler says, use this VM slot zero. So then GitLab runner moves along here, and it actually uses a library called nesting to create the nested VM. So here's a, a little client and uh, a server which is running on the instance. So each one of these instances has a nesting server running on it. And its only job is to sort of manage the life cycle of those nested VMs. So GitLab Runner will then say, okay, I have been assigned a instance and a slot. So I can now tell nesting, create this VM, you know, this image, use this image to create an execution environment on this and in slot zero. So nesting will say, okay, slot zero sounds good. It'll create this. So, um, and then GitLab runner will SSH into the VM itself and put the job inside the nested VM like so. So this is, this is sort of how it manages. It has an agent inside the instance. Um, and likewise, another job shows up it will um, choose slot zero in this other, you know, in the same instance. That's okay. It lets us H in, create the VM. Then it lets us H in um, to the nested VM and it'll run the job itself. Um, likewise, you know, the rest of the capacity could get consumed by additional jobs. They get routed here. Then Task Taylor says, well, actually, you know, I really want to maintain, you know, a certain number of idle machines. 
So it's going to create, you know, when it schedules these, it's going to create another instance to get ahead of the, to get ahead of the demand. And so auto scaling group, you know, it'll say AWS fleet and plugin, please create me more and more instance. The auto scaling group will create the instance. Host resource group will respond to that by creating a dedicated host. Instance will get scheduled on there. It will boot. Once it's done booting, it'll have the nesting server running and it's ready to go. Likewise, when task scaler sees that, um, you know, we don't need all this capacity anymore. Maybe most of the jobs are finished. They could say, uh, okay, I think I'm, I think I'm done with this instance. So it'll tell AWS fleeting plugin, delete this instance, auto scaling group will delete that specific instance. Host resource group will notice that, uh, it'll start scrubbing the, 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 it, this will start a scrubbing process. Host resource group will see that this thing is unused for 24 hours and will eventually remove it. So that's the gist of it. That's the whole life cycle of auto scaling jobs on AWS Max. Uh, I hope this was informative um, and sufficiently visual and colorful. Uh, and I'll write this up also as some text and a diagram. Um, if that's your preferred way to consume it. So thanks for watching. I appreciate you uh, taking a few minutes to learn more about auto scaling mix.